So now let's take a look at the transport layer, first UDP. In UDP, data is sent in discrete chunks called datagrams, and each datagram is sent in a single IP packet, though of course along the way that IP packet might get fragmented. Now again, IP addresses are a sense an incomplete address because when we send data, we really want to specify not just which machine is meant to receive the data, but which program on that machine. That's where port numbers come in. Port numbers are specified with 16-bit fields, so the possible values are 0 to 65,536. And when we write a port number in combination with an IP address, we do so separated with a colon. So, looking at a UDP header, it's always a fixed size and consists simply of these four fields. First the source port, the destination port, and then the length of the whole UDP packet, and then a checksum covering the whole UDP packet and what's called the pseudo header. Again, each port is 16 bits, and if you're wondering how do we know which program corresponds to which port number, that's something we'll discuss a little later. Because the header is always a fixed size, we don't need to specify how long it is, but the length of the whole UDP packet we specify in bytes using 16 bits, so that means the maximum size for a UDP packet is 65,535 bytes in length. The checksum for the UDP packet covers not just the header and the data, but also includes what's called the pseudo header, which is actually a few of the fields from the containing IP packet placed in front of the header. The fields used here from the IP header include the destination IP address and the source IP address, and a few others. Be clear that those fields aren't copied into the UDP packet. They're not in the header or the data. They're just in the IP packet, but when we compute the checksum, we look at the IP packet header to get them. That's why together they're called a pseudo header. The reason we include them in the UDP checksum is to just double check at the transport layer that the packet didn't get misrouted. That really is all there is to UDP. UDP simply adds port numbers because IP in itself doesn't have any concept of port numbers. So now, how exactly does UDP differ from TCP? First off, UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol, while TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. The primary difference is that in UDP, there is no acknowledgement of receipt by the receiver and so the sender has no way of knowing whether or not a UDP datagram actually reaches its destination. And so the sender will not automatically try to resend a datagram that doesn't reach its destination because it doesn't know when a datagram reaches its destination or not. With TCP, in contrast, the receiver acknowledges every byte that it receives, and so when a sender using TCP doesn't get acknowledgement for bytes it has sent, after a certain amount of time, say 30 seconds or 60 seconds, it will attempt to resend the data. And as long as no acknowledgement is received, the sender will keep retrying to send that data. And depending upon how the system's configured, it'll keep retrying, say, up to like 10 times or so before it gives up. The second major difference is that in UDP, when a program sends data, it has to explicitly send each datagram. And each datagram, remember, is up to 65,535 bytes in size. In contrast, when a program sends data over TCP, it just specifies which bytes it wants to send, and then it's up to the implementation of TCP in the operating system to decide how it wants to split that data up into discrete segments which each gets sent out in their own IP packet. It's then the job of the operating system on the receiving machine to take those TCP segments and rearrange them into the correct order when they arrive, and then feed the data to the program which is meant to receive it. And the final major difference between UDP and TCP is that whereas UDP is a connectionless protocol, it doesn't require a connection to first be established before data can be sent. That's not the case with TCP. With TCP, for two hosts to exchange data over TCP, they must first make a connection. Which is to say, both ends of the connection need to get in sync so that they can begin sending acknowledgments for any data that gets received. So, superficially, when a TCP segment is sent, it looks very much like a UDP datagram. And in fact, if you look at the TCP header, you'll find four fields which look very much like the four fields in the UDP header, with the difference that instead of a length for the whole segment, instead there is a length field for just the header. And this header is specified with a 4-bit value, which uh, indicates the number of bytes in the header in multiples of 4. 
So just like in IP, the maximum size of a TCP header is 60 bytes. It's 4 times 15. TCP, though, is of course more complicated than UDP, so in addition to these four fields, we also have six more fields, uh, plus some optional fields, which we won't get into. Very briefly looking at these fields, first you have what's called the sequence number. The sequence number is what specifies which bytes are included in this segment. The acknowledgement number, as the name implies, is what we use to indicate which bytes from the other end of the connection we have already received. After the header length, there's a field of 6 bits which is reserved, meaning that it currently doesn't have any purpose, but in the future it might possibly be used for some purpose. The reason this field is included is really just so that the later fields line up on 32-bit boundaries. The next six flags are used to indicate what kind of TCP segment this is. For example, the ACK flag is set when the acknowledgement number in this segment is valid. Otherwise, if the ACK flag is not set, the acknowledgement number should just be ignored. In the next field, window size refers to the size of what's called the receive window, which means the number of bytes which this end of the connection is prepared to receive. When sending data, you don't want to overwhelm your receiver with too much data, otherwise that data will just get discarded and it'll have to be sent again. So the window size field is used to indicate to the other end of the connection when it needs to probably start sending data at a slower rate so that it doesn't overwhelm the other end. Strictly speaking, this field isn't necessary, but it does help optimize for the most efficient flow of data. Finally, when the urge flag is set, then the urgent pointer is intended to point to some bytes in the segment which contain urgent data, meaning data which the receiving program is supposed to look at urgently. That is, I guess, with a higher priority than other data. In practice, this concept of urgency just really hasn't panned out at all, so it's just not really used.